Welcome to the Art of Procurement Podcast with your host, Philip Eidson. Here, thought leaders share the trends, strategies, and tactics that you can use to elevate the role of procurement and your career. Hello, hello, and welcome to another Art of Procurement podcast. And today we have a show that's focused on a specific category of spend, specifically the legal category. But it's one where I think a lot of the insights are relevant in whatever area of spend you're working in, uh, particularly if you're working in areas that it's difficult to build stakeholder engagement. Because in my experience, I think legal spend, along with marketing, they're really the holy grail for procurement in terms of engaging and influencing stakeholders. And today we're going to talk um, about the legal category and how you can support your legal colleagues in the selection and management of their third party legal spend. And I think there's few people, if anyone, frankly, in the procurement world that understand this category more than today's guest. And that is Sylvia Hodges Silverstein. Sylvia is the executive director of Buying Legal Counsel, which is a trade organization which Sylvia founded that brings together professionals that are tasked with sourcing legal services and also managing the supplier relationship side of um, supplier engagements. Sylvia, in addition to um, being the exec director of Buying Legal Counsel, is also a lecturer in law at Columbia Law School in New York and an adjunct professor of law at Fordham Law School, where she teaches um, law students the business management side of law firms. Sylvia has also written quite extensively on the subject of business management and law, and she's actually had uh, two pieces that she co-authored um, published by the Harvard Business Review as case studies. And one of those case studies explained how a pharmaceutical firm GlaxoSmithKline, how they transformed their approach to buying legal services. So I was delighted after I reached out to Sylvia that she agreed without hesitation to join me on the Art of Procurement, and I'm sure that you'll be able to pull a lot of value out of our conversation. All right, before I roll the tape, if this is the first time that you've listened to the Art of Procurement, or you just want to search through some of our old back episodes, you can uh, do that at artofprocurement.com slash episodes. You're going to find a box as well in the sidebar that invites you to sign up to never miss a show. If you leave your email address, what I'll do is I'll make sure to email you every time an episode goes live, and I'll also send you a couple of featured procurement-related reports that we've had on the show here as a thank you, really, for trusting me with your email address. All right, then. Well, without further ado, let's go straight into my conversation with Sylvia. Hi there, everybody. And as I mentioned in my introduction, I'm excited to welcome today's guest, Sylvia Hodges uh, Silverstein. Uh, Sylvia, welcome. Thank you very much for having me. I appreciate it. Thanks. Well, Sylvia, you really have a broad and quite a varied background when it comes to the law and also the business side of law firm management. And um, I talked a little bit more about that in the introduction to the show. What I was interested in is what came first? Was it an interest in law or an interest in the business management side? It was actually uh, sourcing that came first. uh, Back in the late 1990s, I worked at uh, EAN International, which is now called GS1, which is the association for barcoding and um, lots of people who work in sourcing, I'm sure, familiar with that. But um, I'm now the the executive director of the Legal Procurement Association Buying Legal Council. Uh, I also work as an adjunct professor at Columbia Law School and Mm -hmm. at Fordham Law School, where I teach law students about business and management, which I think is really important that they understand it. And uh, I wrote uh, and edited several books on purchasing decisions in the legal industry Mm -hmm. Uh, the most recent one is the legal procurement handbook that you mentioned Um, and I also co-authored a number of Harvard Business School case studies including from what I know the only case study on professional services procurement it's called GlaxoSmithKline sourcing complex professional services so I mean initially I worked actually on the law firm side Mm -hmm. uh, 
But my thinking was, if I help the law firm to manage and market itself to do a really good job, I need to understand what clients really want. And so I started to research purchase, purchasing behavior around uh, 2005, 2006, so, you know, 10 years ago. Mm -hmm. And I've been doing it ever since. So I've spoken with many, many in-house lawyers, with CFOs, CEOs, and so on. Anybody who makes purchasing decisions when it comes to law firms. Right. And then around 2010, I discovered legal procurement being involved in sourcing legal services. So when I told my colleagues at the university that procurement people are involved in picking and evaluating law firms they were like no no right. no, no. You need to look at this again this cannot be <laughs> but i i you know i didn't give up i researched it in detail and uh, start to organize small get-togethers of legal procurement professionals because most of them they were sort of unicorns in mm -hmm. their in their respective organizations they didn't really know anybody. There was nobody there any, uh, who has done it before them, right? They were all the pioneers. Right. We actually connected them and so they could share their experience and best practices. And at the time, I was actually working at a software company. But um, yeah, at some point in time, people asked me, when is our next meeting? When is our next meeting? So it was kind of an organic thing to start the buying legal counsel that was in September of 2014. And so I'm imagining it's grown then. So those companies who were involved to start with aren't, are no longer just unicorns. As yes, no, it's absolutely. It's become really a trend. The context for the show today, I really wanted to talk about how we actually engage with um, the folks on the legal side, whether it's general counsel, whether it's lawyers, because in my experience, it's always been a difficult, probably the most difficult area for um, procurement to really engage with. Um, I know I've had trouble in the past and you know I've had small successes, successes doing different things, but when you speak generally, I think it's really hard for us to engage with legal. So uh, that's definitely something I would like to um, discuss a little bit more today. When I think of it from a general counsel perspective, you know, you mentioned before that um, a lot of lawyers, they this concept's new to them as well. Why should they use procurement? You know, how do you encourage them to think about using procurement? What's their incentives? Yeah, so uh, many in many corporations, legal services they used to be more or less exempt uh, from mm. the cost scrutiny that other business units and functions have been facing for many, many years. It was always that legal is different, can't right. do it with legal. And I would say the legal departments uh, like that that exemption a lot. But the financial crisis of 2008 and beyond, they really acted as a catalyst and sped up the process for the adoption of legal procurement. I would say that also the publicity about billing practices, big ticket spending, because I mean, when you look at how much, uh, for example, big banks or insurance companies spend a year, I mean, this is just mind boggling numbers. I mean, $1 billion annually is not a, an unusual number. Mm -hmm. And so big ticket spending and increased transparency. We have uh, electronic billing and through the electronic billing system, you have so much more insight that you really didn't have before. And um, so you, I would say that all of this together really caused this, I hate to call it seismic shift, but right. it's really, it really has happened. And let's say... Um, typically, the GC and his or her team typically do not experience a love at first sight right. when meeting for human. So, I mean, it's rather uncommon for the GC to proactively ask for a procurement's help. So, yeah. So you, so you would say that it's, um, it's more coming from above. So it's coming from the C-suite who's telling the general counsel you have to engage because I need to control my spend, or is it? proactive folks in procurement going and saying, hey, I've done my spend analytics, legal, you're my top uh, area of spend and I haven't touched you before. How can we work together? How, how do we usually start to get engaged with legal? Yeah, so typically it's a CEO or a CFO that says, how much have we spent for legal last mm -hmm. year? Oh, my God. But the problem is actually that lots of big companies, they actually don't even know how much they're spending uh, annually, globally, because there's so many different units uh, that 
that might hire um, a legal outside yeah. uh, counsel. Uh, and then in lots of, as I said, in lots of um, multinational companies or big U.S. companies, yeah, different companies, different units, they just do their own thing. There's not a necessarily a lot of centralization going on. So there's a lot of stuff that gets done, uh, that work that gets duplicated or things that just um yeah get get done again and again so a lot right. of redundancy and so on so i would say the main driver to bring in procurement is really the desire to actually manage cost and reduce supplier spend mm -hmm. in the category and really ensure that the company buys the goods and services in compliance with the company policies which in legal don't really happen right and making sure that company gets the the services from the reputable uh, suppliers for the right reasons because um, let's face it often law firms just get picked because somebody had worked there before right. or that's a supplier that uh, we've been using for decades but nobody really knows why so you know procurement can really put um, let's say an orderly fashion and uh, good management um, principles into this so I think it's very important right. that procurement is involved and so when a, um, a general counsel is told by a CEO that you know you've got to come and talk to procurement and he's um he's doing it I, I guess he's not very happy about it what can we do as a procurement function to make that conversation easier for the gc so he doesn't have as much fear as he may have had going in well so i would say about five eight years ago it was definitely much much harder mm -hmm. and actually if we look at uh like the historic view on how legal procurement happened so the first ones that really embrace uh procurement for legal uh, services were, from what I know, uh, really late 1990s. There were a couple of people uh, that did that. And then in the early 2000s, uh, some UK banks tried to bring in procurement, actually do a reverse auction, which was not well received. Yeah, I can imagine. Uh, the, 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 the lawyers, um, neither inside counsel nor outside counsel liked right. it. In fact, that outside counsel said, no, we're not doing this. And so, they, um, yeah, it was, it, was, it was not a success. <laughs> That's kind of the worst place to start, isn't it? Because you're immediately commoditizing what they provide. Yes, and they don't, don't they don't like that. No. But I mean, I would say since about 2010, you really see most of the big uh, legal spenders, so highly regulated industries such as pharmaceutical companies and financial services institutions, as well as energy companies and utilities. Those were the first ones to bring in procurement into the sourcing of legal services. And I would say now, I mean, between what we do as as the buying legal counsel where we really are there to help all those who are tasked with sourcing legal services and, and managing supply relationships, you know, you actually have peers. You're not alone anymore. Mm -hmm. And I mean, if I look at our membership, they are basically uh, procurement professionals of, of uh, Fortune 500 companies and their inter uh, international equivalent. So, you know, you don't need to feel what I'm doing, what I'm proposing is something so unusual. I mean, you can even, as I said, you know, I wrote a Harvard Business School case study on that. So you can actually show your in-house counsel that what you're doing is just actually bringing you up to par with your peers. Right. It's best practices. It's not, yes. you're, not you're not being, uh, you're not coming with some crazy ideas, which is a no. risk to him because, no. you know, you're just being um, you know, radical. Yes. No, I mean, it's, it, you know, it's still early days, I guess, uh, this category compared to others, but you're not a radical anymore. And, and if a, a legal department tells you that you are, so um, I'm happy to give you 10, 20, 30 names of companies who are doing it in your own industry. So so is there areas of spend where it's more appropriate for procurement to be involved? When You know, when I think of that more uh, transactional spend versus strategic or litigation? Or is it a case of just starting with the, the non-strategic and working your way up? Where do you usually see procurement play? So I would say that rather than jumping into the big M&A deal or the high stakes litigation, what I see works best is when procurement starts out with uh, 
purchasing ancillary legal services mm -hmm. such as court reporting or litigation consultants or you know what's called legal commodities so matters of low to medium legal and financial exposure that the company buys in high volume and high frequency so i mean if you start with those and have first successes problem is that you really need to think about you know what is a win because for you it might be a big savings right. the, depending on how the in your in-house counsel colleagues are being remunerated and and evaluated themselves they might not see that as a particular good thing so it's really important to have the cfo on your your side as well because the finance department they normally like all that what what would be a win then for a you know internal legal counsel or for a, for the gen, general counsel that may be different than what we're used to being as a win what may they, may they be trying to get out of some of those relationships well i mean typically for them a win is if a litigation is won mm -hmm. um so i mean very very classic example um i would say that by and large um the legal department are just or traditionally have not been as cost conscious right. as maybe other departments because it had just never been something that was used as a, a yardstick. But when I look at, I mean, so earlier this year in January, we conducted a, a legal procurement survey, um, and our findings suggest that the uh, yeah, that legal procurement is really making significant inroads into purchasing core or what some call bread and butter legal services. So that would be medium to high legal financial exposure that mm -hmm. the company buys relatively regularly. But what I found interesting was um, that legal is actually more and more frequently involved now into sourcing, as I said before, the high value, the high stakes legal services. So I'd say, you know, the first wave of people who got involved in um, 2010 or, or even before, they have really matured and they're pretty sophisticated now and so um you know pretty much most types of matters have become subject to uh, procurement scrutiny mm. from from litigation and transactional work to advisory work so there's really nothing that i would say when you have a sophisticated legal procurement uh department yeah, nothing is pretty much off limits interesting yeah my experience was always that it was easier to get in in some of those ancillary services but then the walls would still go up when uh, you're talking litigation because the concern was well we got to manage risk and we're going to manage risk at all costs so right. we don't really need you when there's actually a lot more that we can bring to the conversation than just helping them manage cost Right, absolutely. Well, so, I mean, I think that building the relationship and showing that you're useful is really important. And, and this is a category where unless you have a good working relationship with your colleagues in legal, you won't be able to do anything. So how do you start building those relationships then? When, you know, as you said before, the general counsel and by association, I'm sure his team isn't really a happy participant at the table. Yeah, so things that I have seen that work are sitting with your colleagues in legal, if possible. Mm -hmm. If that's not possible for whatever reasons, then at least schedule regular meetings and maybe you know book meeting rooms in the legal department and sit with the lawyers. Ask them questions, understand their issues, also learn some lawyer speak, and definitely avoid procurement lingo. So, right. uh, you know, if they they might not care, they they might not understand uh, if, if you if you use procurement speak. I really try to <clears throat> to relate and engage. And uh, what's also important to keep in mind: so lawyers are trained to argue and find fault. <laughs> right. So if you, yeah, so if you come with this suggestion or that suggestion. What I think works better is to come up with different options or scenarios. And by showing them these different scenarios, they can reason among themselves about what's the most fitting solution. And I th think from experience, we've seen that they are much more likely to embrace it then. And unless they embrace it, it's really, really hard. Yeah, so they then ultimately become the decision makers. You're influencing them, but in their mind, they're, they're making a decision. So it's their process. Yes. And I mean, I guess it's probably also the case in, in other areas. But so again, in our legal procurement survey, we've definitely seen that procurement in the legal category is pretty much never the decision maker. Mm -hmm. It 
but you know you're the facilitator the buyer the you're the negotiator and all that yeah and that's consistent with um you know, another area of spend that's really difficult for procurement to engage in, and that's marketing. You know, you often throw kind of marketing and legal together as being the two, the holy grail mm-hmm. of the categories of engagement because they're just so hard to engage with. Right. And I know that in marketing, a lot of it is about kind of throwing the procurement textbook out of the window, mm-hmm. uh, not being so concerned about process, um, but being more concerned about helping the marketers essentially win in what it is that they need to do to meet their metrics to meet their objectives right um, I wondered if in legal it's the same that process and um, consistency isn't as important as you know helping and, and facilitating as you said I think the the being useful so the helping and facilitating is, is really important I would say that process is a little bit easier uh, probably to get through with the lawyers because okay. I mean, there are lots of processes in in the legal industry I mean if you if you have a litigation, there are certain steps that you need to take and so on. So I think that that, that would not be such a, such a big problem. But what you really need to do is when you work with a legal department, think about how you can help them get a grip on their budget because more and more GCs now have the mandate that they need to manage costs. It might not necessarily be to cut the budget by 10%, but actually to stay within the budget they, mm-hmm. they have. And what procurement really has um, going for it is that it can do a lot of the work that the lawyers are neither trained for nor do they might even they might not want to even do that. So uh, what I've seen a lot is uh, legal and procurement assuming the good cop and bad cop roles. Right. So procurement relieving in-house counsel of the uh, typically unpleasant price nego- mm-hmm. negotiations. And so, I mean, so when you look at what lawyers are well trained in, that might not necessarily line up with uh, data analytics and so on. So it can really help them do the analytics and then do these tough negotiations because as per, as a procurement professional, you're not limited by, let's say, well-established relationship with your law right. firm because you haven't worked there. You know, you, you're not, you didn't go to law school with them. So it's a very different uh, relationship that, that you have. Yeah, you can help your lawyer and their um, the partner they want to work with maintain that relationship while being the, the guy that comes in and, as you say, be the bad cop. Right, and they can blame procurement. Right, everybody blames procurement anyway, so. Right, right. Um, You talked about the fact that it's becoming more prevalent for procurement to be engaged in more litigation. And, you know, that was always something that I really struggled with because there were so many reasons that were thrown at you why you couldn't get involved. Mm -hmm. So what are the best either professionals or the best companies doing to actually get engaged with the more complex services? Right. So so actually there's a lot going on in, in litigation and many actually jump into that area now because what you can do nicely is that you can define different phases and different scenarios mm-hmm. and you can work with the law firms on pricing those different scenarios. You know, if this, how much does it cost? How, who would you put on the on the uh on the matter and so on so i mean more and more law firms now have uh, their own business people so what i see more and more is that the procurement people actually don't work with the outside counsel directly but with their pricing directors or pricing and project management directors so it's really about working in phases Mm -hmm. So how you mentioned then that the law firms are getting smarter. How are they reacting to procurement being involved? So at first, uh, again, when I when I discovered procurement in 2010, also law firm people who I know quite a few, they were, I wouldn't say upset, but they were definitely like, what, what is happening right. now? You know, what's, what's this change now? But they were actually pretty fast to embrace this new world. Uh, when I spoke at conferences, every now and then some partner would pull me aside and ask me, you know, like, when is this going to be over? And typically <laughs> this 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 was uh, procurement being involved. Um, I don't encounter this now anymore. So people have become accustomed to have procurement in, in the room as well. And as I said, the law firms themselves have hired 
pricing uh, people and uh, project management right. uh, directors, because as I said, they are they are the natural counterparts of procurement, and they speak the same language that you do. They speak business, so it's a very good thing to get to know your friends on the other side because they will try to uh, work with you as best as they can. So I want to move into the bidding process itself and then how you manage your suppliers in the legal space. Okay. And, um, you know, maybe this is an open-ended question, but I'm thinking about how you structure an RFP uh, for legal services, spe especially around areas where it's really difficult to build a specific scope because it's for a matter that's forever changing. You know, what do the best RFPs look like? Or how do you go to market to try and buy a service where the scope isn't really defined and can change day to day based on how the matter changes and evolves? Right. So it really depends on the company. Mm -hmm. But in the legal category today, most companies select panels of preferred providers for a period of typically two or sometimes three years. Okay. So, But some companies like GlaxoSmithKline, which um, I mentioned earlier, uh, which I discussed in the Harvard Business uh, School case study, they use a sourcing approach with a reverse online auction for their large matters. So anything valued over $250,000 uh, or more uh, has to go through this process. Word of warning is that you really need to have set up a very good process and need to have all your pieces lined up right. so that you can run it in such a time frame. And so you already know all the, the ins and outs and the strengths and the weaknesses of the providers before you even go to market. So that's a, a lesser part of the process. Right, that that would be a, a good thing. Uh, in terms of you asked me about what, how would you go about it? So typical questions to ask in legal uh, concern a uh, hey, firm's representative cases or transactions. So in mm -hmm. other words, can they hit the ground running, or are they going to take a lot of time learning about this issue? Then also, what's their proposed staffing? So what team I'm getting? Are they good people? Do, do I trust them in their expertise? Then obviously the proposed fees and costs. And one thing that I think uh, procurement definitely has to keep in mind is, yes, you can discuss rates. So rate cards, very typical mm -hmm. task. But unless you know who's going to be on it, or what level these people are, and how many hours and how many people, you really have not reached anything. So um, if you want to manage it uh, in a more holistic way, then maybe you want to have an alternative fee arrangement. So that is you know, something other than an hourly fee arrangement, like a flat fee or okay. a fixed fee. And how prevalent are alternative fee arrangements becoming? So a few years ago, alternative fee arrangements were also unicorns, but it really depends on the practice area and the law firm and maybe the market. But mm -hmm. I would say anywhere between 20 to, I've heard as, uh, numbers uh, of over 80%. So I would say there are no limits. It really, you need to be clear about what you are signing up for because you need to make sure that what you're getting is is obviously the the right deal for you so if it's a completely complex thing with a firm that you've never worked with before it probably might not be the best thing to go mm -hmm. for a flat fee or fixed fee but if it's something where you know you've bought it so many times you know you have a good understanding of what it takes uh, for that kind of matter, well, you know, why would you pay by the hour and basically, um, you know, I don't want to say encourage inefficiency, yeah. but, you know, potentially pay for inefficiency. Right. You don't want that. So how would that work for a, um, for litigation then when you, I, I guess most GCs are probably concerned with settling the matter just as quickly as possible. Do these, would the service provider essentially get a bonus for settling, for being able to settle early or would they still get their fixed fee for the project, whether it lasts for two weeks or three months? Um, how would you build that into that model? Well, again, it depends on the company. Certainly some want to uh, settle everything early and fast and others are perfectly fine to fight it out okay. to the last moment. So the how you would go about it is that a the law firm needs to be completely on board with what it is that you want to do because if they are intent to fight it out and um you're paying by the hour that would be a problem right. particularly if <laughs> right. you settle it fast right um but it's all about 
um, being on, on the same page as to what it is that you want to achieve. And then again, as I said before, um, work on it and look at it in terms of different phases that would make a lot of sense. Mm-hmm. And so when you're analyzing um, various different proposals, are there any red flags that you look for when you're thinking about whether a firm is essentially out there to maximize its billings versus you know, provide the high quality service at, at the lowest cost possible and, and be a partner? Yeah, I mean, so there are a number of things that you that you should really ask for to understand. You know, for example, we talked about efficiency. So if you ask, like, um, do you work efficiently? And then everybody will give you their boilerplate and mm-hmm. say, yes, of course, they are efficient. But if you ask something that's much more specific, um, give you an example. So our company uses process improvement methodologies like Six Sigma or Lean. We expect our suppliers to use equ- equally efficient techniques. Please explain your firm's methodologies. You know, right. when you ask something more specific yeah. or something along the line, how would you measure your performance against our business requirements and so on? So I think that, that will give you a, uh, some a good uh, insight into do they just talk the talk or do they actually know what they're doing? Right. And then, so you ask about red flags. So depends on what you're looking for. So f- for example, to identify excessive billing, you could look at, and you have all this information when you y- use e-billing systems, electronic billing systems. So you can identify, for example, are there any timekeepers who you build for over a certain amount of uh, money annually? Mm-hmm. So I've seen, I've analyzed um, data and I've seen that for like a five or six year um, attorney, the law firm charged the company $2.6 million. Wow. So, I mean, you know, that person normally would cost the, the you know, if you, if you, if you bought, if you brought that, that resource in house would cost you maybe, I don't know, 250, 300,000 at the most. Mm-hmm. So, you know, you need to kind of look into, would it make more sense to hire this person if you have this same need um, on an ongoing basis? Or are there any timekeepers who build you over a certain amount per week or per year? So, uh I have, I know that from lots of management consultancies, they actually have a limit of how much a timekeeper can bill you per week. And some firms like um, Boston Consulting Group, I think it's like uh, 40 hours a week. Right. Whereas for law firms, and I've asked lots of law firms that question, I've never heard that anybody had any limit. So, right. you know, that you might have, <laughs> you know, I don't know, 24 7 build. Mm-hmm. So, um, or does the firm bill you on an ongoing, continuous basis, uh, timekeepers with more than 12, uh, 14, 16 hours a day? I don't know about you, Philip, but you know, after working for 16 hours, I don't think I'm going to be interesting anymore. I don't no. know. But, well, it depends what the hourly rate is, I guess. Yeah, I guess. So. No, but, I mean, you know, th- those were the things um, to right. look with in, in terms of excessive billing. Then if you look at staffing issues, so do you, do junior associates bill more than 10% of the hours on a matter mm-hmm. or are the partners uh, spending over 10% on, on administrative clerical tasks? And so on. And then there are also, um, you can, red flags for billing practice issues would be, so do they miss billing codes? Uh, Do they block bill you? So block billing is basically when a lawyer lumps multiple tasks under one billing entry. So instead of separate listing of of each task and time, the the lawyer basically lists multiple tasks under this one time entry. So there's no transparency. Right. So the problem with this practice is that it really allows the lawyer to to conceal that the actual amount of time spent on each task. And it really prevents you uh, in procurement to determine whether each individual task were performed in a reasonable amount of time. So, I mean, we're not um, thinking that might necessarily happen, but it would be a great way to pad a bill if you do that. As procurement has been involved then and and we're running the RFP process, you know, there's a lot of pressure now on the uh, legal firms who may not have had competitive cost pressure before because they could just bill what they like. How do you incentivize them to participate when their margins are going to be compressed? and encourage them to do it at the same level of quality that they may have done before when, you know, they could be 
getting they could be receiving 20 percent 30 percent less than they used to do how can it incentivize them? It's in a number of different ways. So obviously the easiest one, if you are a big name, if mm-hmm. the, if the firm really wants to have you on their client roster, that would be the easiest way to get them in. But also having interesting, challenging matters. Law firms love that kind of stuff. So they, they would really go for that. Then another thing that incentivizes them is if you have many cases and big legal spend. So yeah. Because the volume of your work may allow the firm to make a profit on on the work that they do for you due to the learning curve. And also, if you use, uh, let's say, a more structured method and use project management and all these things, firms might be eager to actually want to learn how to be more efficient. And because, you know, working with you can help the firms to be more competitive also with Mm -hmm. other clients who might not be um, a long that far and then last but not least um it also helps if you're known as a client who pays their invoices uh, on time and pays fast so they like that too so you've selected your supplier or you've helped the legal organization select the best supplier for their case what are some of the key metrics that you see used is there some standard metrics that that somebody can use in uh, measuring the performance of a law firm once they're engaged and involved so pretty much everyone that I know measures the total spent by law firm. Mm-hmm. Some of them, you know, who are the timekeepers and, and how many hours on that. What I see more and more happening now is that um, clients measure satisfaction. Yeah. So before the law firm can be paid, they actually, the in-house counsel has to uh, rate on different dimensions how satisfied they are. That can be from the how they uh, worked on the matter and how business oriented it was to how they were being treated and the, uh, whether they stayed in budget and all these things. So those are different ways. What I think would also make sense, but um, according to the the survey that we did early this year, I think that there's still a lot of homework to be done in general is measuring volume of active matters. Mm-hmm. Uh, you can measure um, average blended rate, meta cost versus benchmark, meta duration versus benchmark, or timekeepers per matter. And uh, Philip, you know, a lot of this information now is actually out uh, in the market. So there are benchmarking providers that you okay. can look at. And uh, so you get a good feeling of where you stand. It brings a lot more visibility, and I'm guessing a, a um, I guess in the law firms are ca- kind of challenged from that because they've been used to operating in their little bubble with the uh, with their counterparts on the corporate side. Absolutely. So we're running against the clock, unfortunately. Um, I do have a final question um, uh-huh. that is hopefully just something that a um, procurement professional or leader can take away as an action item from today. Um, and that was, what's one thing that that we can do in procurement as a professional or as a leader to really increase our relevancy to the legal team? So I would say reach out to your colleagues in the legal department, get the backing of finance, but understand what keeps legal up at night and connect with your peers in the other co- uh, companies. Because as I said, you're no longer alone. See what path your peers have taken, learn from their successes and mistakes and really adopt legal procurement best practices because they exist now. And so why wouldn't you want to do it? It's a great category. And I think it has a lot of growth potential, both in the companies as well as law firms, more and more law firms now hire procurement people Mm -hmm. to help them become more competitive. Sylvia, I've got to wrap up. Um, What I wanted to say is that um, I mentioned the fact that we have show notes um, for the page associated with the interview. I'm going to link up to the uh, Harvard Business Review case study that you mentioned and a couple of other documents that you talked about at the top of the show. Um, I know you have uh, an awful lot of content um, on your site regarding buying legal services um, that's just a great help to people if they want to know more so I'm going to put that all together link up to it and the uh, the web address for that will be artofprocurement.com slash legal services that's all one word so artofprocurement.com slash legal services so uh, Sylvia just thank you very much for your time and um, for sharing some of your thoughts around legal spend it's been um, I think very valuable and certainly much appreciated Thank you very much for having me. Appreciate it. Thanks, Sylvia. Thank you. Thank you for listening to another episode of The Art of Procurement. To find an archive of all past episodes, you can go to artofprocurement.com slash episodes. 
And to ensure you never miss another show, go to artofprocurement.com slash subscribe. Mm-hmm.